Hello and welcome. You're listening to Sparking Spiritual Growth. I'm Jason Sparks, and for all of you here on Kingdom Purpose Radio, thanks for tuning in. In Exodus chapters 3 and 4, Moses goes to Egypt and he successfully convinces the elders of the children of Israel that God would work through him to redeem Israel from their slavery. This is what they've been waiting for, they've been praying for. And and Moses was going to do this, but he had to learn an important lesson that evidently the elders of Israel already understood. And the lesson is one that is urgently needed when you're establishing a new nation. It's a great message from God. It's also one that we need to relearn today. Here's the message. God is sovereign, and He expects His creation to treat Him with respectful obedience. That's what He had to learn, and it's amazing how it kind of plays out here and reveals that and teaches some incredible lessons for us too, so we can go through this. So there there are basically four ideas that we're looking at here. And these are things or ways that God reveals His nature and teaches us about what it means really to have a a nation that is good. And it also is a way for us to, as individuals, we we can see how to live our own lives, especially when we're talking about men who we, we expect the men to be the leaders in the home. And we want to see if you want to be a man who is leading, who a man who is uh, commanding respect, so to speak, you're going to have to learn this lesson. God is the one who is sovereign. He expects His creation to treat Him with respectful obedience. That includes all of us. So we, if we understand God's nature, we're going to understand how it is that we can be the people that God wants us to be. The first way that God revealed His nature is in chapter 3, in verse 2, where it says, "...the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire." This is the, the burning bush event, right? So the the bush was burning, but it was not consumed. And in verse 3, it says that Moses went up to see what was happening. He wanted to find out, how is this thing on fire, but it's it's not burning? And this is when God noticed that Moses was curious. It said, it said that he saw that Moses was approaching, but basically God told him to stay away. He said, you stay right there. Listen to how it's stated in the Scriptures. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4 So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Here God is showing a part of his character, part of his nature. And it's not his nature is not in the fact that he could uh, that he's causing a, a bush to burn that wasn't being consumed. I mean, sure, that's a great thing, but there's more going on here than that. This was a warning to Moses because Moses was about to step onto the land that the Lord God was upon. He was entering an area that was dangerous for him. So when God is in a place, it's it's too dangerous for those who don't recognize what's happening or what's going on. It's always been that way, but God is revealing here. He's protecting Moses by stopping him, saying, Stop! Don't go any further. Do not approach me. You are not in a place, you're not in a position to approach me because your mind is not right. So he tells tells him to take his shoes off so that he would recognize the fact that God is there and that he can't just approach God at any time. And this is the way it has always been for God. Um, you, You don't just approach God. You're invited to participate with things. And of course, as His children, we have, that's one of the great things that we can see in the book of Hebrews, that we actually have the ability to approach God whenever we want to. But that's not anything that's going to happen in history until the time of Jesus. At this time, when, when Moses was alive, you didn't just randomly approach God. You had to do it with, with very... Uh, It had to be an open-ended invitation that God would allow you to approach Him and come into His presence. He still deserves that kind of respect, but He's allowed us to actually approach 
whenever we want. So we can go to, to the throne of mercy and, and throne of grace anytime in prayer. That's not the way it's, it was in the Old Testament. But there, is, there are some great lessons here about God and about His nature that God is revealing here to Moses. When God's in a place, it's too dangerous for those who don't recognize what's happening. There are people who don't recognize that approaching God in worship is a very serious matter. You know, God demands things from us. He always has. He demands respect. He demands worship. And He demands holiness from our heart and mind. That's what He demanded here of Moses. He said, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. So He expected Him to make a change. And holiness really is understanding um, the, the nature of God and understanding the difference, that there's a difference between God and anything else that, that exists. And you treat him with that kind of respect. And so in this case, he told him to take his shoes off. He demands holiness. The Bible is absolutely full of people who didn't show the proper respect for God, and they paid for it with their own lives. Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10 is a great example. They offered fire and that God didn't demand of them, and they were, they were put to death because of this. There, there are a lot of people in the Old Testament especially that didn't respect God the way they should have, and they ended up dying for it. There are examples in the New Testament too. Acts chapter 5, go look that up. You'll be able to see Ananias and Sapphira and how that they lied to the Holy Spirit. And it, was, it seemed like it was such, such a simple little thing. It was kind of, one of the, what we might call one of those little white lies. But because it was such a simple little thing that it's, God still put them to death. It didn't protect them because they didn't treat God with respect. He demands respect, worship, and holiness. The law of Moses had a lot of laws in place to protect people from just those kinds of things. Uh, that they were protecting people from God when they approached Him in worship. You know, it's even interesting that the, the Levites, the priests, they had to even wear undergarments so that when they were walking up the steps to make a sacrifice, that their nakedness would not show accidentally, and they become defiled. And that's something that they could lose their lives for. God was very strict in how He approached things, and He was teaching a lesson. And it's a lesson that we need to pay attention to too. also. He demands respect and holiness. And sometimes today, it seems like people don't even care what God expects. Um, they don't think it even matters, but it has always mattered. He still expects respect, worship, and holiness. Now, today, it's not about a physical place. It's not that we have to make sure that we enter into a church building, we take our shoes off. No, that's not the point at all. God doesn't live in a church building. He lives within us. But we still have to take care of that. We still have to understand that. Um, he is in our hearts, and we better pay attention. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 32 says, Therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you, you shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Joshua chapter 23 and verse 6 says, Therefore be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. And then in, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 in the New Testament, it says, Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And what he's saying there is, if, whatever it is, word or deed, and that pretty much covers everything, right? Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all by the authority of Jesus and do it with a thankful heart. And in fact, seven times the Bible says, be holy for I am holy. We do things the way God wants them done because He is holy. We act the way that He wants us to act. That's a very important lesson for us to recognize. Now, if you're going to consider what that means for a nation, of course, we need to understand that, that God expects for His people, God expects for the entire creation to treat Him with reverence and honor, respect, worship, and holiness. And I recognize, you know, we're, we have a difficult time thinking that we could actually impose upon other people, create laws that, that requires people to worship. 
I don't have to want to create a law in the in, a, in the United States to force people to worship. God already has that. He already expects that from us. It's not up to me to to legislate that. God has already legislated that. And here's the thing about how our democracy and our freedoms work. It only works because we as individuals have personal responsibility. When we stop having personal responsibility, our ability uh, to work as a nation, it, it just goes away. We, we have to have some controls. And so if we're not going to control ourselves, then the, the government has to control us. But if the government is run by the people, by the votes, then obviously the government isn't, gonna, isn't going to control us. So in order to gain control, people have to come into power somehow. And that's not a good situation. So right now we're kind of seeing a situation in, in the country in my opinion, where there, there's a lot of disharmony, there's a lot of distrust, there's a lot of turmoil and problems and difficulties, and a lot of those are because we are not taking care of ourselves. We don't have personal responsibility anymore. We've given that up, and we have all kinds of reasons why we can't take care of ourselves, or we shouldn't take care of ourselves, or we're going to do whatever we want to do and not worry about the consequences for everyone else. Now, obviously, that's not everyone, and if you're listening to this program, you're probably not in that category of people. But it is a tendency, if you look around, we have people who are just unruly. And what I mean by that is not that they're not following the American laws, that's really not the issue. The issue is they're not even following their own laws. They're not even considering what it takes to be responsible for themselves. And here's the first lesson of being responsible for ourselves. Understand the nature of God. He demands that we treat Him with respect, that we treat him, that we worship, and we also live holy lives, lives that are separate and distinct from what we'd call the normal world. They're separate and distinct. We, we live a life of holiness. We live a life that is separating ourselves from sin. And that takes responsibility. It takes personal responsibility to do that. And that's the first lesson that we have to learn. And that's what a, a lesson that Moses is learning when he's sitting at this burning bush or he's watching this burning bush and God tells him to take his shoes off. That little bitty thing that God did there tells us a world of things for us, gives us a, a, a monumental look at, at the fact that God has a nature and He demands that we respect it and we apply it the best that we can. So starting there and for the rest of the Bible, and, real, and really even before that, this is the message. God is sovereign. He is the one who's control. He expects His creation to treat Him with respectful obedience. And until we learn that as a nation, or we relearn that as a nation, we're doomed. And this is exactly why God had to teach this to Moses, because if Moses didn't get this, then he's not going to be able to teach that to anyone else. Be holy, for I am holy, God said. The next idea that we're going to look at here, as far as the nature of God that's being revealed in these two chapters and the lessons that Moses had to learn in order to help develop and establish a, a mighty and righteous nation is that they had to Moses had to learn and understand exactly what freedom meant. He needed to see exactly what God was going to do for Israel. This all comes from one verse in chapter 3. That's chapter 3 and verse 12. It said, So he, God, said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, that is a very interesting passage because it says, this is what he's telling Moses. Moses, you're going to go get the people. And you're going to free them. You're going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. You're going to bring them out. And here's proof. When you do that, you're going to come back here and you're going to serve me. You're going to worship me on this mountain. And when he says you there, he's not talking just to Moses. He says you, that's plural. That means all y'all. 
Everybody that is in Egypt is going to come and worship me. And this will convince you, it will prove to you that I am the one who did this. He also had marching orders. Moses did whenever he knew that whenever he left, he took Israel out of Egypt. He knew the first place he was going to go was right there to that mountain where he was, where God was speaking to him, and he was going to t- he, he was going to cause the people of Israel to worship God there on that mountain. And it's exactly what he did, and it's even more proof and evidence that God did this. But I want you to know something about this because in chapter three and verse twelve. We need to understand that God is saving His people, the people of Israel, from slavery in Egypt. And the slavery was not something that uh, it, it's not something that was foisted upon them uh, generations before. This was something that gradually came to be. Right? It's not that they were taken from another land and brought to Egypt. It was that they were in Egypt and through social and political pressures and political maneuvering, they were the Egyptians were able to just basically enslave this whole people out of fear. Now, see previous podcasts for that, for, for chapters 1 and 2. And that's exactly what we need to see, that they're, they're now slaves, and God is going to free them. And the reason, he, the reason He's going to free them is because He... He hears their cries, and the, the, it's very tough for them. And, and Egypt was making it very difficult for them uh, to live because Egypt, remember, was afraid. The, the Pharaoh was afraid because the, the children of Israel outnumbered or would soon outnumber the children, the people of Egypt. And they were afraid, and he used this as an excuse to say, well, listen, if somebody attacks us, the children of Israel are just going to turn around and attack us too. And, and Then they'll be able to leave. They'll destroy us, and we'll have nothing. He used that as a way, then, as a means, that fear. He used that as a means to um, get the people of Israel under his thumb, to to enslave them. But we need to recognize that uh, there's, there's more going on here when we're talking about slavery, to be a slave. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, This is the sign... This shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Some translations say, you shall worship God on this mountain. And that's the way the word is usually used. But it's also used, that word literally means to be a slave. So what he's saying is, I am taking you out of slavery and putting you into slavery. Now, we recognize that there is a difference because the slavery that they are in right now at this this point in history was severe, and it was from Pharaoh, and it was was human overlords. And he's saying, I'm going to take you out of that. I'm going to take them out of that, and when I do, they're going to come and be my servants. And the great thing about being a servant to God is that God treats us better than we deserve. He, he certainly loves us, and He dotes on us, and He shows affection, but we, we need to be careful to understand that there's a relationship here. Now, I, I realize that in the New Testament, we're not slaves, we're children. And really what we're talking about more than anything is a, a mindset that we have. The mindset says that I am going to be a servant. I'm going to be a servant somewhere. Somehow I'm going to serve. I'm either going to serve sin or I'm going to serve God. And when we look at it that way, we recognize that just because I'm a child of God doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want to do. It's never been that way. God has always expected us to treat Him with love and with respect. He's always expected us to treat Him as as holy and to live our own lives as holy. But we don't see that today. Think about this for a second, because there's so many people that don't understand what freedom means. Freedom, when we talk about freedom in politics, we're talking about political freedom. That means that we don't have overlords. We don't have people that uh, are enacting laws that are unfair. We don't have, we're serving ourselves. Um, We are making our own laws as we see fit for us to take care of ourselves. Those are things that 
that represent freedom for us. But it has never been the case in history that people were free, morally speaking. That is, that there we have never been free to do whatever we want to do, and we can just live an immoral life because we're free. But I see people today, and I see it frequently, and it really it really shocks me when honestly when I see it. They say, I have a right, I'm a Christian, I can sin all I want to because God's forgiven me. That's not what God means by freedom. Look with me in Romans chapter 6, and, and Paul addresses this because he actually was being accused by some people of teaching that very thing. But Romans chapter 6, he lays it out and shows, I'm not teaching any of those things like you think that. Look with me, starting in verse thir- 16. So do not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey or servants, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death." But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how can you read through that and think, well, God's going to allow me to do whatever I want to do. I don't have to worry about whether I sin or not, because I'm free now. That, that's not what God was saying, and that's not what freedom is. And freedom as a people, we need to understand that, yes, we may have political freedom in this country, and that's a great thing to have. But we are never free from the moral laws that God has enacted. We are never free to just behave however we want to behave. There is always going to be a punishment or a result in that that we don't want. The wages of sin is death. And we're fooling ourselves if we think that we can just get away with it because we're free. Look in John chapter 8. Some people uh, would rather hear from the words of Jesus. Well, listen to what Jesus had to say about this very thing. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 30, He shocked the people of Israel who were the children of God. Listen to what it says here. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. So he's talking about believers here. He says in verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If the son makes you free, you're free. But if you go serving sin, you are a slave to sin. That's what he's saying there. Now, if you want to be a slave to sin, you sin. That's what it means. And when you sin, see, what happens when you sin is you are you're going to receive a penalty for that. The wages of sin is death. And now you're stuck. If you when you sin, you are you are getting you're going to get the wages of that sin unless you've been forgiven. But we can't just continue to sin and hope that things go away and hope things get better, hope that that we'll just be forgiven. Uh, and so we can just sin, and the more we sin, the more we'll be forgiven. That's outrageous. Romans chapter 6 again, at the very first of this, he, he deals that directly. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So if we have died to sin... How is it that we're living in it? You, you might say, well, how did I die to sin? He says, don't you know as many of us as were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, that old man of sin, was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So you have, if you've been crucified with Christ in baptism, you have been freed from sin. Don't go back into it. You're going to become a slave again. It doesn't mean that you can't be saved, but you can't just be running back and forth between those. Because when we do that, we are, we're making light of the sacrifice that Jesus made. We're treating it as if it's nothing. Oh, I'll just go get forgiveness. No, that's not the way it look, to look at it. We see sin as something that enslaves us. We don't want any part of it. Smart people are going to choose to be enslaved to God, not sin. And until we as a country can understand that, we're not going to make much progress. We won't help people financially. We won't help people um, socially. There are all all kinds of ills and ailments in this country that will never be solved until we as a country come to grips with the fact that we have an obligation to be freed from sin— and really, if we're freed from sin and we encourage other people to be freed from sin, we're treating, that means we're going to be treating each other well. It only makes sense. So it's better to, treat, to teach people how to treat one another than to legislate how people treat each other, right? So if you teach me then to treat people with love, that I'm, that's going to accomplish a whole lot more than you sitting down and making all the laws about the things that I can't do. If I'm treating you with love, I'm already going to avoid all the things that I shouldn't be doing. Now, obviously, we're going to have to have laws and things like that, but you understand what I'm saying, I hope. If we will take care of doing the right things and living the right way and getting rid of the sin in our lives and helping other people get rid of the sin in their lives, we will make this world a better place. But it's only going to come as people understand this lesson. So we have to understand what freedom is. And, and Moses certainly, in establishing a new nation, he had, he had to understand what freedom is. And he had to understand what God was actually doing. He wasn't freeing Israel from Egypt so that they can just go do whatever they wanted to do. No, when they came out of Egypt, they were expected to follow God because you're either following sin or you're following righteousness. And we can talk about our rights all that we want to. We have so many rights in this country, but you never have the right to do wrong. And God teaches us that very thing. A third idea here that, that we have to see in order to understand what it is that makes a nation great and what it is that, that Moses had to get so that he could establish this nation in the right way was we, we see that God shows his sovereignty in overcoming the excuses that Moses made. I think we have to understand that sometimes we don't always cooperate with God when He tells us to do things, but He's patient with us. And it's interesting here are some of the excuses that Moses gives because God is telling him, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell them to let my people go. And of course, I, I suspect Moses is floored. He's, he's thinking, this is crazy. There's no way I can do this. He's probably terrified if you think about it, he had, the last time he was in um, Egypt, he had killed someone, and he was on the run. Remember, it's been 40 years, but he's still out there, and he's still probably people would know him and know what had happened, even though the people that were going to put him to death are dead. I could imagine he would be afraid of going back. So he starts doing what we all do. We all have excuses, don't we? We all have our favorite excuses about why it is that we can't do what God wants us to do. And we say, so we say similar things about this. I mean, how many times do you make excuses? To, we're going to blame something or blame someone besides ourselves when we don't do what God expects. 
This world has a victim mentality. We want to blame everybody under the sun and everything under the sun except ourselves. But that's not any way to live. That's certainly not any way to lead. So look at these and think about these um, these excuses that Moses made. And I think you can probably see a lot of them yourself. In chapter 3 of Exodus, in verse 11, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? This is an excuse that we call false humility. Who am I? Why are you going to call me? Now, in chapter 3 and verse 12, the very next verse, God said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So God says, don't worry about it. I'll be with you. But notice what Moses said. And it's we need to understand this is false humility. How do we know it's false? Because God would not approach you to do something if he didn't know that you could do it. Why would God go to Moses and tell him to go let the people go, to go say that to Pharaoh, if he thought Moses couldn't do it at all? If Moses was so inept that there's no way he could do it, why would God ask him to do it? Are you going to go up to someone, if you're a boss or you, you, know, you have a, own your own business or whatever, are you going to go up to someone who has no coding experience, no experience with computers, don't even know how to, doesn't even know how to turn a computer on? You're going to go up to that. Would you go up to that person and say, hey, I need you to sit down and write a program for me tomorrow? There's no way you're going to do that because you know he can't do it. Why would God go to Moses and ask him to do something he knew that Moses couldn't do? So the very fact that God is telling him to do it should have told him that he could do it. So his humility was fake. Who am I? Why should I be the one? You know, a good answer to that is, why wouldn't it be you? Why couldn't it be you? So you might ask that same question, who am I? Well, who are you? Maybe you need to recognize that God can be with you. And it may not be false humility with you. It may just be fear. It may be the second objection here that we're going to talk about. That's what we call imposter syndrome. That's found in chapter 3 and verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? So here, this is kind of one of those things like he, he says to God, you know, when I go to them um, and I talk to them and they ask me this, I'm not going to know how to respond. In other words, I'm not enough. I don't have the answers. I don't know how to do things. And so they're gonna, I'm going to go there and they're going to ask me things and I don't know how to answer these things. It's imposter syndrome, what we call that. You, you think that you're not enough. You think that you, you don't have enough information or that you won't be able to get enough information to do what God wants you to do. But God said in chapter 3 and verse 14, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So furthermore, that, I mean, that's what he said. And so he gave him the answer. How, how difficult was that? Surely... When he was going to, when Moses was going to have to present himself to these people, surely he could simply ask God if they asked him, and they say, "Who is? Who are you? Or who is God that's sending you? What is his name?" So they're trying to verify that Moses is actually who he said he was. All he had to do was ask God, and God could have told him right then. But God went ahead and told him now because this was an excuse. This was a reason, and really, we think about it, it's a terrible reason. I just don't know anything, and God tells him the answer right there. Now he's taken away that excuse because um, there's no reason he can say that anymore. It's amazing when God does that to people. It's happened to me too. I'm, I tell you what, I mean, these kinds of th excuses, we all use them. Uh, you know, let's just be honest. We use excuses. And it's great to see that God can help overcome them. Objection number three is he has no authority. Now, this is similar to the imposter syndrome, but listen to what he says in uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me, or they will not listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. All right. Now, that's something that actually could be more credible, at least from their response. They may say, I don't, you, you know, I don't believe you. 
Well, this is where God actually give him, gave him three different signs. The first one, this is chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. The first one is to throw down his rod, and it became a snake. And then when he picks it up by the tail, it, it would become a rod again. All right. The second one was to put his hand in his bosom, you know, put it in under his cloak. And when he pulls it out, it would become white with leprosy. And then when he put it back in and brought it out again, it would be clean. Okay, so that's a miraculous thing. And the third one would be to take water from the river and pour it out on the dry land, and it would become blood. So he gave them three, he gave Moses three different signs and said, Okay, listen, if they tell you I don't believe you, just do these three things. He took that completely away from him. And sometimes we need to recognize that God gives us the ability to prove to other people something about um, what God wants. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be able to go and throw a rod down and become a snake. That's not going to happen. But God does give us the ability to prove what we're trying to prove. And as long as we're not trying to prove ourselves, we're trying to prove God, we have plenty of evidence. We don't need to worry about it if someone says, I don't believe you. Well, you know, if there was a, a debate between a Christian and an atheist, and the Christian was talking to the atheist, and, the, and, the, and one of the things he said was that the belief in God was not a matter of the intellect, it's a matter of the heart. Now, the atheist didn't accept that, but that is the truth. If someone does not believe in God, it's because they don't want to believe in God. There is plenty of evidence out there. But if they don't want to believe, they're not going to believe. But we can give them evidence, though, and we can help them believe. So that's objection three, the idea of not having authority or not being able to do it because people won't listen. Uh, that really is not an excuse because there will be people that listen, and we can convince. We can help people learn. Objection four is, uh, this is one, that I just can't do it. I'm, you know, I have poor skills. Chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. I've personally heard that one a lot. I just can't talk. I've asked people to you know, give devotionals or you know, preach, <laughs> and I hear that a lot. I can't say prayers in public because I, I'm too slow of speech or I, I'm not eloquent enough. And my first question to them is, have you heard me? I mean, I'm not eloquent either, but that's not going to stop me. You develop skills as you go. And, and I love God's answer in verses four, uh, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. He says, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now go, therefore go. And I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what to say. That's powerful. And this is, that's what he told Moses. I'll teach you. I will help you. I believe with all of my heart that God can help you develop skills. There's no such thing as a skill that's unlearnable. Now, there, there are some ca caveats to that. I, mean, I, re I realize that there are some things that we just, we just have limitations I'll probably never be able to be an operatic singer, but I can still learn skills, right? There's still some things that I can learn, and I can learn how to sing. It may not be great, but I can still learn how to do it. And all that is required by God is not perfection. It's not eloquence. It's obedience. It's availability, not ability. God can work through you, and God will be with you. And if you want to be a leader, if you want to help uh, your family grow and develop, and I mean, you want to be ahead of your household, you need to learn the skills that it takes to do those kinds of things. If you want to help in society, learn the skills. God can help you do that. And the final excuse was given. And that was just outright refusal. I mean, he didn't even have an excuse in this last one. Chapter 4 and verse 13 says, But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. In other words, just send anybody else but me. I don't want to do it. That's not, that's not an excuse at all. It's just rejection. Now, this is when God got angry. It doesn't say anything about the previous four. God's patient, and He's caring, and He says, I'm going to help you through this. I'm going to show you how to do that. 
But when he just refuses, it says in verse 14, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he, when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I'll be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I'll teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take his, this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs." So he still gives him an answer, but now he's angry about it because you don't refuse to do what God wants you to do. But this is exactly what he was trying to do, and he wouldn't have it. God wouldn't allow it. There's so much in these excuses that fit us, aren't there? I mean, if we're honest, there's sometimes when we run out of excuses, (laughs) what happens? We just don't either, we just don't do it or we decide we're going to do it. And we got to make that decision, don't we? We're either going to trust God and believe that that He'll help us, or we're not. And that's what it all comes down to. Think about how this applies then to leadership or anything that God is wanting us to do. We can make all the excuses in the world about why we're not doing it or why we can't do it. In the meantime, God is still sitting there saying, Yes, but I can overcome this. Yes, but I can overcome this. Yes, but I can overcome this. Trust God. He will help you. He is sovereign. That means when he say we say that he's sovereign, that means he is ruler over everything. He he can do everything. He's sovereign. He expects his children to treat him with respectful obedience. And if we don't do that, we're going to be in trouble. And now we move into this one last section, uh, one last lesson that Moses had to learn. Uh, about the nature of God. That's chapter 4, verses 20 through 26. And in this, we're going to see that God means what He says. Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Sipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he, God, let him go. Then she said, You're a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So it's interesting because God tells him, you go to Pharaoh, you be sure to do all the things that I've told you to do, show them the signs, and then you go to Pharaoh and say, you let my people go or you will die. Your son, your firstborn sons will die. That's ultimately what's going to happen. And from that, you would think everything's great. But then on the way there, God meets him and tries to kill him. It, it is intending to kill him. Now, obviously, if God wanted Moses dead... He would have been dead. But he showed up somehow to present himself in such a way that he was threatening to kill Moses. And Zipporah, his wife, understood what was happening, and he re- she recognized that the reason for that was be- goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 17, 10 through 14. This is the covenant that God made with Abraham that all of his descendants would be circumcised, the males would be circumcised on the eighth day. And evidently, there's a boy here, one of Zipporah's sons, that was not circumcised on the eighth day. And so God was going to kill him over it. This was a sentence of death for the father. And Moses is about to be put to death. That's amazing because God here has raised up this man. It's been 80 years of work, basically, to get Moses to the point where he's ready And God is willing to throw it all away and start over because Moses had sinned. Until this point, it was just all talk. It was just talking about what was going to happen. But whenever he is going to actually do it, before he is actually engaging in what God tells him to do, God steps in. This shows the nature of God. He expected respect and obedience. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, 
But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? We've got to learn that lesson. Notice that it was after this that Aaron showed up to help Moses. Aaron was a provision by God. He was, gonna, he was given by God to help Moses do what God told him to do. But Mo, Aaron didn't show up until after Moses got things right. Because if you look into this text, it's after this that Aaron showed up. But if, in fact, in verse 27, in verse 26, we ended, it says, He let him go. So then she said, You're a husband of blood because of the circumcision. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. That happened only after Moses got his life right. So many things, there's so many provisions that God has for us, and He's going to help us in so many ways. And a lot of those provisions that have been promised to us are simply dependent upon us to, to get things right. We've got to change ourselves and start doing what God wants us to do in order for us to receive the provisions that God has promised to us. It only came after Moses got things right. Anyone who wants to be a leader in God's, for God's people they got to first clean up your own house. you got to get your own life in order first. Then you can worry about other people. Men, do you want to lead your families? Get your life right first. Do things that, that God wants you to do first, and He will give you the provisions you need to take care of your family. How can you have good families and obedient children if you're a hypocrite? That's only going to last so long, right? And we all know that. You're going to have to bully your children in order to get their obedience if you're a hypocrite. I mean, that's the only way you're going to have any authority over them is to scare them to death. And so they'll, they'll obey because they're scared of daddy. But that's not true obedience. That's slavery. Children and, and even wives, they fit in here too. They're not stupid. They see. They know if you're living the way that you're, you're requiring them to live. They know if you're living that way. So you may require all these things from your wife or your children, men, and then you're living however you want to live. You have no control over yourself, but you have all the control over them. That's not living a, a life of, of godliness. We need to learn how to take care of ourselves, and then God will provide for us. That's a lesson that Moses needed to learn. God's nature demands proper treatment. We've got to understand who He is and what He expects from us. So he revealed himself in this burning bush experience, and, and then he, he patiently worked with Moses through all these excuses that he had. And he, of course, he taught great lessons. He taught a, lesson, a great lesson about freedom and, and what it means to actually be free. And then he also showed that he means business. When God says to do something, we better do it. We better make sure that we have uh, all of our ducks in a row. We have our I's dotted and our T's crossed. We do everything that God wants us to do. Now, obviously, he, he can't uh, demand perfection of us and actually have it come to, to come to pass. We are not perfect beings, and God knows that. The point is not that we're following a God who is uh, unru unreasonably harsh. It's not that he's requiring things that we can't do. But we have to be loyal to Him. We have to be faithful to Him. And if we want to receive the blessings uh, of God that He's promised to us, most of the blessings that are promised to us are dependent upon our response to His gospel. Sure, there are things that God does for everyone. He makes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, as Jesus said. There are blessings that you may receive in life. There are good things that, that may happen to you in life. And you may even have a, 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 an abundant life in some ways. You may even have some happiness in life. But that doesn't mean that God is with you. So many times, you know, we, we kind of mistake blessings for favor. We, we think that because we've received some blessings from God that, that He's okay with us. That may not be the case. Because Jesus Himself said, like I said, Jesus Himself says, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He causes the sun to rise for the just and the unjust. So receiving those kinds of blessings is no evidence at all that you're right with God. 
And there are a ton of other blessings that you only receive when you start doing the things that God wants you to do. And not just talking about them, not just preparing in our minds to make sure we're doing, we're kind of, you know, stowing up so that we can do what God wants us to do. No, it's when we actually start doing what God wants us to do, putting our life together in the way God wants us. It's only then that we actually start receiving the blessings that He's prevented, that He has uh, provided for us. And there are so many blessings to being a Christian, aren't there? If we look and understand who God is, we understand what He expects from us, the respect, the worship, and the holiness of heart and mind, and we start living that way, there's no better life. And the freedom that He provides when Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, that freedom... Even though we're, quote-unquote, you know, as I said before, we're servants to righteousness, we're slaves to righteousness, even though that's the case, we are the most free we can ever be when we're serving God. Because God's Word is nothing, is, is nothing except what is best for all of us. And when we live in what is best for us, we are blessed by the way that we live. We just have to submit ourselves be humble enough to look and realize that there is a God, there is a being who is far superior to us, and He knows what He's talking about, and we need to learn to put our trust in Him because He understands, and He is powerful enough to provide for us all that we need. We're free. We're not free to sin. I hope that this has been helpful for you. I know that we've covered quite a bit of territory in this, and I, I think you can see a lot of different lessons, a lot of different layers for this. We have the big layer that, you know, this is what it takes for a, a nation to be righteous, right? And this is what God expects. And these are great lessons for us uh, as far as our nation goes. And we can even see how that because our nation has violated some of these, that we're having difficulties and problems. And of course, no country is, is perfect. And we, we recognize that. But in order to fix those, we need to recognize where it is that we're violating God's will and, and change those things. And we do that individually. We also see that in a lower level in the sense that we can see in our, our, our communities, but, but really also in our families. And then when we understand what it's like in our families, of course, we need to understand that this applies to us individually. We need to understand that God is in control and God expects us to treat Him with respectful obedience. And that's the only way we're going to be able to improve our lives. It's the only way we're going to have true freedom in life. And I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions or comments, please get a hold of me. You can email me, jason at sparksmore.com. And, uh, you know, we can talk about anything. If you need to uh, send me your phone number, if you need to have a, a private conversation or something like that, uh, I'm completely open to that. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't, I don't have uh, anything to offer as far as something you can buy. I don't even ask for donations. I don't want that. All I want to do is help. And I believe the Bible is able to show us how to live in the best way possible. And, and that's what this is all about. It's called sparking spiritual growth because i want to kind of put that spark there i want to help you see oh here's some things that i can grow into that that i can learn why because i've learned a lot uh you know the word of god has helped me more than i can even say it's just amazing what's happened to me in my life and the transformations that have been taken place and certainly i've had times where i was going the wrong way but but when things are going well and, we, and we're looking at the Word of God and, and I'm seeing changes in my life, I can't help but say, listen, you can do the same things. You can have so much more in your life than you're probably having right now. And I can say that confidently because we always can get better and we can always have more from God. I don't think God is, uh, you know not wanting to bless us. I think he wants to bless his children and he wants to make life greater. In fact, if you think about the fruit of the Spirit, and we have just the first three, love, joy, and peace, that are mentioned there in Galatians chapter 5, with those in life, we have love, joy, and peace. Uh, that's amazing in, just in themselves that God provides those things for us. In fact, if you read through those, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, godliness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, 
He says, against such there is no law. There is nothing stopping you from having those things. And in fact, there's nothing stopping you from having more of those things. There's, no, there's nothing in this, in this world that can stop you from having more joy. God himself is not going to limit you. Can you imagine God telling you, I'm sorry, you've had too much joy. You can't have any more. Or you, you love too much. No, that's not possible. You can't love too much. But what happens is we get in our own way and we put restrictions on ourselves and we have all of these excuses about why we can't have more joy in life or we can't have more peace in life. And we refuse sometimes to do what God wants us to do. But my hope is that I will encourage you to decide today that you're not going to put limitations on what God wants from you. That you're not going to accept the excuses that you normally give that you're going to allow God to take all those things out of the way so you can be a stronger Christian. And if I can help you with that, please let me know. Jason at sparksmore.com. I'd love to talk to you and uh, show you even more. And if you have things that you can add to this, I'm an open book. I would love to hear from you if you have things in, in addition to what I'm saying. Thank you so much for listening. Please, if you enjoy what you hear, share it with other people. Uh, give me a good rating, uh, and, and let's let other people join in with what we're trying to do here. God bless. I'll see you next time.